<laughs> okay, thanks, Rita. So when I was uh, learning about what's going on here, I was told that uh, some people use PowerPoints and visual aids and uh, many of you who know me, I'm much more of an audio kind of person rather than a visual kind of person. Uh, so I don't have any visual aids, um, although I might have some audio aids, but, um, and I come from a tradition of storytelling, uh, both in my musical background, in what I do for a living, which is basically um, when I was a trial lawyer, it's storytelling and in yoga, they, and I don't mean asana yoga, I mean the big picture yoga, the meditation, all that stuff. And the gurus, it's none of this stuff is very much of it is not written down. It's handed down orally. So this is a story. And uh, I begin by telling you um, just very shortly a, uh, a Chinese proverb kind of story. Uh, and then, uh, then I'll go to the story that I wrote for this. Um, so there's a Chinese uh, proverb that starts out, there was a wise farmer in China and he had a wonderful son and he had a wonderful farm and he had a beautiful white stallion. And one day the white stallion ran away and his neighbors came to him and went, oh, it's such bad luck that your stallion ran away, bad luck. And he said, we will see. And so after the stallion had been gone for a while, the stallion came back and brought with it 12 wild horses, which the farmer could use to plow his fields. And his neighbors again stopped by and said, oh, what good luck. And the wise farmer said, we will see. And so the, the son, the farmer's son was riding the horse one day and the horse threw him and he broke his leg. And again, his neighbors came and said, oh, such bad luck. And the wise farmer said, we will see. And then the emperor's army came and enlisted everyone, all of the boys in the village, all the young men in the village for a war, except they couldn't take the farmer's son because he had such a badly broken leg. And of course, the story ends with the farmer saying, you know, the, the villagers coming and saying, you know, what good luck, you're so fortunate. And the farmer says, we'll see. So I've written a story kind of like that that'll tell you kind of my story. So, and if I look down here, it's because I, I, I wanna, it's not that I don't my, know my story, I just don't wanna get off on a tangent because there's a lot, lot to it. Okay, so. There was a little girl and she was born into a family with plenty of food, a nice roof over her head, two parents, an older sister, good schools, pleasant vacations, lots to do, and lots of good experiences in the world. So good fortune, we'll see. So, but the house that the girls lived in was a house full of secrets and the father, drank too much and the mother cried a lot and the girls didn't spend much time with each other because they were growing up kind of confused and angsty and not really trusting the world and not really trusting each other very much so they grew up kind of alone bad fortune right well we'll see so the older girl became shy and withdrawn, but the younger girl had such a desire and such a loneliness inside of her that she really sought out other people wherever she could find them. And one of the places that she found them was at a place called Peterkin Conference Center, which was the Episcopal Church Camp uh, in West Virginia. And she went every summer and Peterkin was fabulous for her. She found God. She found people who accepted her. She found people to love her. She learned to play the guitar and to sing. So good fortune. We'll see. Um, the Peterkin Conference Center that she went to was in the 70s. The counselors were flower children from the 60s and 70s. 
it won't surprise you, or maybe it will, that drugs and alcohol were also part of that church camp experience, believe it or not. And so um, drugs and alcohol became part of the little girl's life. And um, good, you know, bad experience, bad, bad luck. Well, we'll see. So the next one is just kind of a, 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 a continuation of that. So the girl becomes a teenager and she is into drugs and alcohol and she still feels a little alone and depressed when she's at her home and not at church camp. And she ends up trying to kill herself. And she ends up in a psychiatric hospital at the age of 15. So certainly bad, right? Well, we'll see. So at the hospital, she gets help for her problems, uh, not the alcohol and drug problems, because that, again, we're still in the 70s. So, but she got help for her loneliness and her depression. And she learned that she needed to take charge of her life, that her life could be defined by her past. Her life could be defined by her home and her parents, or she could take charge of her life and she could go forward deciding for herself what she wanted to do. And so the girl gained some confidence, became less confused and more um, self-sufficient. So good thing, right? Uh, well, we'll see. So um, she got a good education. She got a, you know, she got good experience. She got a good job. She even had two children to love. And of course that's all very good, but the job was hard and scary and there were times she felt overwhelmed and she continued to abuse alcohol thank god the drugs were gone at that time but um and the, the her son's father who also abused alcohol abused the son and her the girl's world was thrown into chaos and despair. And she just, she was at the bottom, but luckily she, um, she still had her experience of the past. So in her despair of all of this stuff happening, which was in her view, the worst luck that could have ever possibly happened. She was sitting in the Episcopal church and all of her self-sufficiency that she had learned and all of the confidence that she had had left her. And she said, God, I can't do this by myself. I need your help. And at that moment, everything changed. So it didn't change by a bolt of lightning. It was not immediate. She still had the, to deal with the son who was three and not doing particularly well in this kind of abused situation. She still had to get him help. She still had to get herself help for alcohol. She still had to do a lot of work, but things really started to move along a different line. And she started getting more involved in her church and she got a prayer group and the prayer group prayed for her and the prayer group prayed for her son. And she became involved with ministries out of the church and, and uh, eventually um, she was doing quite well in the, in again, but again, still the alcohol was still there. And um, she was seeing she was seeing a uh, an assistant priest who was praying for her. Of course, she didn't tell him about the alcohol. But um, and during one Lent slash Easter season, she hit rock bottom with alcohol, and we won't go into that story because it's not very pleasant. But 
And again, she asked, she turned and said, God, I can't do this by myself. Not only do I have to have you, I have to have other people to help me because it's just not working. And again, it was, that's where everything changed. And um, so the girl came into recovery and um, met other people in recovery, people who had lived through experiences uh, like hers. She lived, they, she met people who lived experiences not like hers. She met people who were poor. She met people who were rich. She met people who were white. She met people who were black. She met people of all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, but they had one thing in common. And that thing in common was a past of adversity. And she came into recovery and she found these people and she was able to take her experience back from learning how to take care of herself into a pro program of action. However, it wasn't kind, the kind of action that she took when she was younger. It wasn't an action of, I have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. It was, I have to do the work. She also was able to bring her spiritual experience into it and say, yeah, I got to do the work, but you got her in charge. You tell me through these people, you tell me through my experience what to do. And I promise to try in my human and imperfect way to listen to what you have to say. And when I'm going down the wrong road, send me some signs and I'll try to get back on the path. No matter how many times I fall off, I'll try to get back on the path that you have for me. So um, obviously looking back on all of this, the girl said, you know, it's been an interesting ride. And she could see how her past had led her there, but she was still a little, I don't know, resentful that she had the past that she had had until one day when her son was 16 years old, <clears throat> I'm sorry. He said to her, I'm glad for every bad thing that ever happened to you and every bad thing that ever happened to me because without those bad things, we wouldn't be here. And here is Hassan. And from that point forward, she knew that there's no point in resenting the past or regretting the past. In Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a part of the big, the promises that says, we will not, regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will see, no matter how far gone down we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. And it's been an amazing ride for myself and for my children. And it's just been incredible. So um, I have two things to, to, uh, and I want to say, and I want to say this too, that Jonathan Evans in our book group had said one Sunday, he said, the Lord's prayer does not from Aramaic translate into deliver us from evil. It also does not translate into save us from the time of trial, like our, our new version says. What it translates into is open us at the time of trial. I know that I was at my most open when I was at my most broken. And because I am a, because I was born a child and because even though I'm supposedly an adult, 
<laughs> I'm sure to God, I'm still a child. Um, if everything had gone smoothly and wonderfully, things would be much different. And of course, here is awesome, just like my son said. So um, what I pray for now is to have the openness at the time of trial, have the courage to say, I can't do this, you have to help me. To know that whatever happens, it's gonna be okay. So I'm gonna leave uh, this with two things. First of all, the quote from Julian of Norwich that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And then of course, those of you who know me well, I couldn't end without a song. My daughter says I have musical Tourette's because I break into song at the most odd times for no reasons, but here goes. There's only us, there's only this. Forget regret or life is yours to miss. No other world, no other way. No day but today. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. And thank you for sharing stories. They're so important in each one of our lives. And I appreciate how just sincere, insightful you have been for us today. Thank you very much. Um, and what we would like to do is uh, those of you who may have questions or observations or just want to raise other aspects of uh, facing adversity, knowing that God is also within that adversity, that God's with us in everything that happens uh, to us. I want to give you that opportunity. Uh, you'll find um, uh, the best way to do this is if you would raise your hand, uh, but using the, uh, uh, there's a button at the bottom of your screen, reaction that has raise hand. And so if you'll just click on that and we'll take, um, you know, uh, you in order of raising your hands as we uh, go along. So open this up to everybody here to be able to share and uh, go back and forth. Annie, I know one of the things that really struck me again was when you were talking about being at your lowest point was where you were most open to receiving things. And I know I've experienced the same thing in, in my life. Um, it, it's kind of one of those moments where you, you just feel so alone and there's nothing kind of like left. And it's all of a sudden just saying, okay, <laughs> whatever you want to do, do. And it's, it's amazing because most of us in our daily lives want to be open to God's spirit working in us. But a lot of times we're our own worst enemies that way. And we, we actually can block with what's going on. I don't know if that's been your, your experience also. 
Well, you know, I go back to being in recovery um, because that's one of the easiest places to demonstrate it. You know, nobody, nobody walks, walks into AA because they're having a good day. <laughs> nobody. You know, people don't say, oh, I drink too much and it was really great, but I think I'll give it up now. No, that's not how it works. You know, you have to get to the point where desperation is... Um, is what's leading you to it but once you get there and it's not instantaneous but over the years very very few people that I know in recovery um, are of the mindset that it was the worst thing that ever happened to them most of them will tell you it's the best thing that ever happened to them because Otherwise, they would not have the life that they have. They would not have the relationship with God that they have. They would not be open. They would not have taken the path. They all say, you know, if I had, if I had chosen the life that I wanted, if I had been able to, to choose the life I wanted, I would have been cutting myself short. Well, Vince has his hand up, so Vince, if you Unmute and share. Hi, Annie. Um, my question, Annie, is about the, there's another side to you that these folks don't know about, and that's your love of yoga and mindfulness. Um, how how much of a how important was that in recovery and in your daily life? So, you, so I am of the mindset that I'm seeking God in anything that I can find God in. And I've been fortunate enough to be exposed to um, all kinds of spiritual programs. Um, I, my husband and I studied with a Native American medicine man. Um, and like Vince said, I study yoga. And again, it's not the twisty bendy pretzel, although it's been some of that. Uh, it's the meditation, um, the turning inward. It's the, the end of the, the, the eight limbs of yoga end with the same thing that the 12 steps of AA end with. And that is you're trying, you are having a spiritual experience. It is enlightenment. It is union with your true self and with, with God. And, um, you know, yoga has been another mindfulness meditation, um, has been another way, another tool, another whole toolbox, um, to use in conjunction with the church's toolbox and, you know, recovery's toolbox. Um, and Native American spirituality toolbox, which includes things like sweat lodges and, and ceremony and that kind of thing, um, all geared towards opening. It's all geared towards opening me to God and to my surrender to God. That's actually one, that's one part of yoga. It is surrender to God. Uh, Ishvar Dryer. So anyway, um, thanks for the question. Any other uh, questions or comments or observations? Donna? Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Michael. Um, just a, a little bit of what I'm thinking and want to say having to do with uh, your wonderful story, Annie. And I mean wonderful in terms of touching me and obviously touching others so that we can um, reflect and think about our own lives. Thank you for that. Um, so we were 
couple were, of you were asking me about our recent trip and a lot of what we did on our trip was hiking. Uh, part, the two major components were visiting with friends um, and family, which was very profound, and then also hiking together, Marcus, my husband, and myself. Marcus is my husband, Annie, and um, myself. And I find that being outside, whether it's in our own backyard or in these on these hikes, um, I feel whole. I feel, uh, if not whole, I feel more whole <laughs> than I do um, otherwise. So what, um, in terms of your story and <laughs> my pain, uh, my adversity through the years, uh, what I've decided to do, uh, this came to me since we've been back, back home, um, and I turned my attention to a visit to my original homeland, Oklahoma, and my family there, which I'll be going there probably in October, November. And I started thinking, you know, how can I transfer? How can I make more whole myself with God's help by trying to experience nature there and going back to, um, I think it's very healing for Marcus and me to be on his homeland that he grew up in, in England. Mm -hmm but we haven't done the same with my homeland and i'll probably be going there by myself and so what i thought was you know i need to plan some hikes or at least one hike and i started these i was flooded with these images from when dad would take us my brother and me to places around where we grew up to a little creek called Cedar Creek and Mountain Fork and Big Cedar and Three Sticks Monument. And it was all out in nature. And then I looked online and the Ouachita Mountains are one of the most ancient forests that are still there in our country. So I thought, okay, I'll go down there and I'll do this by myself. Um, now, some of it isn't, uh, probably safe. There's a lot of meth labs down there and oh. some of it pro probably isn't pretty because it's not like the UK. There's a lot, of, sometimes trash out. But at any rate, I thought I've got to do this. I've got to go back to my homeland. I've got to do this. So I thought, okay, I'll probably be doing it by myself, but I've still got to do it. So I called, my, oh, actually my sister-in-law called me to express condolences about the queen because she knew we, we would be grieving, having, especially having just gotten back. And so Leslie said, you know, how was your trip? I got started talking about it. And I told her about this dream of mine to hike the land, to hike the land of my girlhood and with an intention to recall happy memories that we had while not necessarily um, not letting the sad ones in but just to recall think re remember myself and our lives and leslie said donna i want to do this with you i walked with her through breast cancer uh several years ago and her treatments and we had a special time together and she said i want to do this with you she said you continue in adversity to give love and i know this is going to be so healing for both you and me and she's really looking forward to being my companion on this journey of healing and being whole in God's beautiful world and with God in our hearts. Thank 
Thank you, Donna. And uh, Betsy has her hand up. Uh, so, Betsy, if you would. Um, then... Thank you, Michael. Um, I just, I wanted to preface this. Annie, thank you. I, your, your candor, um, your openness, this was so beautiful and so moving. And I, I found myself thinking from the mouths of babes, what your, your son's comment that, you know, that, that um, you can't resent or regret the past because it, it's part of your here and now. And it's how, how you want to view that, um, how you want to incorporate it into your story, as you were saying, Donna. So I wanted to thank you for that. I, I was just, I was moved, so moved by what you said. And you use the word surrender a couple of times in your remarks. And I think um, I, I think we all have something that we go through life with that we, the false life raft, we hang on to that. And, and you know, some, it, it may change throughout our, our lives. Uh, different times, it will be different things. But until we surrender and realize that life raft is the false one and really open ourselves to where God will be in our lives where God is taking us to those scary, messy places. Um, we're not going to be whole people. So I, I thank you for, for um, making that so clear to me. And Donna, I loved your remember because that's, if we're not going to be doing that with our past, the people, the events, remembering them into our present, we're not going to be whole. So thank, thank you both for those comments. And Michael, just one comment. I don't know if everybody else is hearing it, but when you're talking, there's a little bit of feedback. Right. Through. Okay. Uh, uh, Judy and then Grace. Uh, so Judy, you're next. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? So I yeah. just wanted to thank Annie very much for this talk. This is a topic that's very difficult to speak about. Um, but I, I wanted to put a plug in for Al-Anon, um, and that's a 12-step program for those of us who may not have had a problem with drugs and alcohol ourselves, but have suffered from the effects of drugs and alcohol um, because of a friend or a loved one. So I've been in Al-Anon uh, Al for 16 years, and um, I just can't speak highly enough for what I've gained from it in terms of my my inner journey and also um, my, my, my surrender to God and my, my ability to um, make God foremost and also God's will foremost in my life. So I, I think I never actually, so I had a son who was struggling, very successful son. He was um, very, um, you would never have known that he was struggling with alcohol. And, and when he was 46 years old, he, he lost his battle with alcohol and he died by suicide. And that was ab absolutely the time in my life when I learned what faith was because every minute I had to say to God, please do for me what I cannot do for myself because I can't get out of bed, I can't put on my clothes, I cannot feed myself, I can't go downstairs and make a cup of tea unless you help me. And, you know, it was a minute to minute battle and then it became an hour to hour battle and then a day to day battle. But I learned that that, that faith, because I so believed it, because I had to believe it, there was no other choice. I had to make it through. My son left two children. They were, they were 15 and 10. My daughter-in-law was just absolutely devastated. Everybody was devastated. My two other sons, were, no one could function. None of us could function. But I was the one who had God. You know, I learned how to pray to God. I did the, the third step prayer. I know you're familiar with it. Every single morning, I've done it every single morning for 16 years. God show me my next step, show me what to do. My will, thy will, not my will be done. Like I, I so have believed that even before um, my son died. And I, I just know now in my soul what faith really is. And I remember that Father Mann had once said, 
faith is accepting that there is, and I was so impressed when he said this, that faith is accepting the order and sense of things, even when you don't, can't hardly accept the outcome. Like the outcome is absolutely not anything you ever would want, but you understand the sense and order, that there is sense and order and there's a reason. And I also feel very strongly about what you said. I remember when I first came into Al-Anon, uh, and my my son was younger at that time, 16 years ago. I um, somebody said to me, "You will be happy. You will be happy someday. You will understand and you will appreciate this experience." And I thought, "How could you ever appreciate somebody being an alcoholic and you know putting the family through this?" But you know what? I I do feel that now. I see that. I understand that. Because I would have never known myself. And I was doing Eastern practices since 1975 and meditation and, and, and all of that stuff. And it got me to a certain point. But that last piece was really knowing what faith was. And I, I have to tell you, I have faith. I really do. And I don't think I ever would have found it uh, the same way that I have found it now. So thank you, thank you so much for your uh, candor, candor and honesty. Thank, thank you. you so much for your story too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Grace? Well, first of all, uh, Annie, it's great to, to see you and uh, to listen to this um, wonderful testimony, really. Uh, I have a friend who's been down the road and back again. Also, um, Judy, uh, uh, a son was lost uh, to him uh, through suicide, drugs and alcohol. But um, so it's, this is just a, an amazing experience today. Excuse me when I think of him. So um, I just also, Annie, I, I really enjoy your music and your singing at the Tazday services that um, Rita and Michael have got, gotten going again, I know with help from others. Uh, uh, so uh, it's so much fun and I love singing and I love music and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, yeah, Rita. Annie, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't have words to express the way in which in such a brief period of time, you created such a history for all of us to understand and to reflect on our own lives. The question I have um, is one that I struggle with personally, and that is that pivotal point in adversity when you can go either way, where you can either get sucked into that muck and just wallow in it, or when you can reach out toward the light and, and try to do as you have done. Can you talk a little bit about that in, in your life, that pivotal moment and how you chose what you chose? Well, for me, I mean, I said how it was a pivotal point and, 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 it, and, and it was, but my experience is not that God gives you one chance at this even in the same stuff that's happening. I mean, the truth is, you know, when I found out my son had been abused, I damn near drank myself to death. It was all I could do to, you know, go to work and to, you know, and I had to throw myself into reading novels and what, I mean, you know, and I, and it's, and out of that, I decided to have another child so that I could have something to focus on. And that's how I got my daughter. I mean, you know, so I didn't do everything. I didn't always it wasn't like I chose this over that. And then that was what happened. It was like every day there were little choices to make. And every day I didn't make the right choice, but I was given another, another opportunity to, to, to make the right choice again. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, my, my husband, some of you know this, my husband, <laughs> he says he's an agnostic, right? Um, yet when we were up and you'll appreciate, oh, John's not here, but he he'll, he would appreciate this. We were up at Holy Cross 
in uh, New York uh, over vacation like three weeks ago. And at Holy Cross Monastery in uh, Newburgh, New York, or wherever we were, outside of Newburgh, um, my husband had his own drug and alcohol and uh, experience with the Episcopal Church at the monastery, because he used to go up there and hang out with the monks and all that or whatever. But we went up there and he he was just overwhelmed and moved. And he talked about how this was the pivotal point in his life or whatever. And he could have gone down one path or the other. And he was, you know, he was in tears and he said, it's just such a miracle. And I had to keep my mouth shut because <laughs> I didn't want to say, oh yeah, that was God in your life. Cause he doesn't, he doesn't respond well to that. So I just let it go. But you know, it's every day. And, and, you know, the, the Taz, a, I don't choose the songs that I sing at Taz a. I let them come to me. You know, I, I didn't choose the song that I sang today. It came to me when I was thinking about this 20 minutes before I got on here. Um, it's an everyday thing for me. Um, I have one little tiny story that just happened in the last couple of weeks. So when I came back from vacation, um, my my dog of 11 years, my, my baby, cause my babies are my, my human babies are grown. Um, but my baby was sick, but I didn't think he was terribly sick. So I got home on Saturday on Sunday, my daughter and I went to a friend's house to pick up my car and all that stuff. And we were coming back and I don't know, I just said, you know what, I'm going to stop at the animal welfare league. You want to stop at the animal welfare league? She's like, sure, let's do that. So we go in and we, we, uh, we go in and we look, whatever, and, and um, you know, and I'll, I'll stop that story and jump ahead. The next day, I go take my dog to the, uh, to the vet and find out that he has a mass. And by Wednesday, I had to put him down. But that Sunday that God said, go to the Animal Welfare League, I ended up with a little <laughs> black kitten. <laughs> And so now I have a little black kitten that is, his name is Loki, which is from, my daughter named him that because uh, you guys are probably familiar with Marvel and all that stuff, but Thor's brother, who is the god of chaos and mischief's name is Loki. So he's the god of mischief and, and he's just wild. And so every day when I get up and I look at the picture of my chihuahua and I want to cry, Aww. I can't stay Aww. in it very long because Aww. I get attacked. <laughs> but you know i get attacked and 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 my feet you know he's at my feet or he's purring all over me or he's demanding to be fed or he's you know messing around with the other cat or whatever and it's just a joy but god was there he was there in that little thing and I, i'm blessed to have had enough of those kind of experiences that when it comes into my mind even if I'm afraid to do it, even if I don't want to do it, even if I think it's silly, I do it and see what happens. And most of the time, it really, I really truly believe it was God speaking to me. Some of the times I have to admit, it's like, well, you probably made that thing up yourself, but, but most of the time, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm in it for the percentages and the percentages is it's mostly God and <laughs> It works. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Andy. Uh, appreciate the explanation, especially about the process, rather than just having one moment, because it is constantly ongoing. So thank you for that. And Donna? Yes, Andy, I would um, like to hear your thoughts on detachment. When I think of AA and Al-Anon, I think of one of the big lessons in it as being able to detach. And I think that's an important lesson for me right now. And it's, and I think of it in the context of my story that I told earlier is this plan for nature walks in my hometown and in around my hometown has to do with, it, it seems that often each time I go back 
to love my mother at the end of her life, and I have all my life, I've gone back to do that after leaving, it seems like each time uh, her, her comments may get meaner and meaner to me. And it's intergenerational wounding of women, mainly. I mean, people, but in my family, it's mainly women wounding mother to daughter. And I'm her firstborn daughter and have gotten a heap and helping of it, um, mm -hmm. as did she. So she's done the best she could. But at any rate, the detachment piece of this, I'd like to hear from you. Yeah, well, well, um, and, and I learned that in Al-Anon, believe it or not, um, because I did go to Al-Anon um, after I came into AA. But and yoga has that aspect too. It's called a it's called a pahigraha. It's uh, it's detachment. Mm -hmm. And when you first hear about this thing, you think it means shut down all your emotions surrounding that situation. Right. But that's right. not what it means. What it means is, uh, and I've heard so many things that helped me. One of the things I heard when I was in AA is what other people think of me is none of my business. You know, um, it doesn't, and, and that was told to me and I, I got that, you know, so I'm not supposed to be thinking about that, but over the years, I got the, the deeper meaning of that, which is what happens with them is their experience. It isn't, it, it isn't me. It's their experience. You know, my father, who was my abuser, I made peace with him before he died. I loved him. He was a good man in, in a lot of ways. He was also a very damaged man in a lot of ways. And he could be very damaging himself. But one of the things that I heard, um, in AA was there was a girl named Dor a woman named Dorothy and she said she could not get sober until she completely gave up all hope of a better past. Mm -hmm. And to me that you know it means I mean I can't I can't make my father you know Papa Walton. I can't make my mother you know not that she my mother was warmer than the Walton's mother. But anyway, I mean, I can't make my home experience the Walton's. Um, and and sometimes I have to, you know, my parents are gone now, but sometimes I have to detach from, you know, my sister and, and what goes on with her or whatever. But it doesn't mean I, I still love her. I love her. What I have to detach from, and I've learned this over the years, is really, it's not really detaching from her. What I have to detach from is my opinion of what's happening with her and yeah. how that affects me. Cause it really affects me a lot less than I think it does. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Annie. Um, again, a lot of good insights being shared here by all of you and in story format. And one of the things I, I just want to reiterate is, you know, when we talk about scripture in particular, we usually forget that it comes from oral history and that people had shared their stories of how God was a part of their life, especially in adversity. And when you read the Old Testament in particular, talk about earthy and a lot of violence and life being very difficult. Boy, it's just jam packed with it, you know. Uh, so each one of you today have really added so much to a spiritual insight. And you know what I love most? is we haven't used any theological terms. We've been talking about our guts and our heart and our emotions and how real life is. And that's where God is. And you don't have to use fancy words or 
theological terms, you know, we've used the word surrender, detachment. And if you look at any of the, you know, classic spiritual writers, you'll find those words. And, but the way we've been playing with them, and when I say playing, I mean being able to just let it flow and not get it all up here, but get it within our whole being. So each one of you, you've been sensational. This has been a magnificent, really insightful sharing. I, I thank Annie for setting it up and giving more insights. And each one of you has shared part of your stories and your insights. Thank you for that. Just been marvelous. Thank you. Oh, thank, I thank my higher power for sure. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And uh, before we go, would like uh, Rita to maybe give us an example of what's coming up next. Okay. Um, in, I'm, I'm still filled with all, all of this. All I could think of, Annie, is, is your line all the time that always rings in my head, which is, you believe in the God of opportunity. And this was such an opportunity uh, for all of us to, to look at whatever adversity we have in our own life and then, and then just think about all these things that everybody has said. This has been one of the best presentations. Thank you. Coming up, other presentations. In October, John Garisto, and those of you who are familiar with the book group know John, he's going to be sharing with us his ideas on what it means to be healed. So looking at adversity from a kind of a different angle. Uh, in November, um, Meg Larrabee and Mark Merrill are going to be sharing with us. Meg um, it directs the prayer shawl ministry here in, in, at St. Boniface. And Mark Merrill uh, does the same thing in his parish in Colorado. And they came to knitting as a spiritual experience from very, very different views. And so um, they're going to share with us how that has been a part of their life. And in December, Tom Carney is going to be um, sharing with us uh, the spirituality of serving others. Um, and those of you who know Tom know that he pretty much every day of the week is volunteering someplace else. Um, he's amazing with what he's done with that in his life and how that impacts him. So we're looking forward to all of that and then onward to 2023 and more surprises. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Uh, would like to end with just one simple thought. We were created in love. And that love is meant to be shared each and every day. Our God is a God of love. So I send you forth into this day knowing that you are loved, you are God's beloved, and God invites you to share that love with those around you. God bless and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank Thanks, you. Rita, for inviting me. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.